Dinner and a Book is supported by the Rex and Alice A. Martin Foundation of Elkhart, celebrating the spirit of Alice Martin and her love of good food and good friends. American writer, syndicated newspaper columnist, and playwright, George Aid used street language and slang to describe daily life in Indiana and at his job in Chicago. Aid's fables and slang gained him wealth and fame as an American humorist. Purdue's Ross Aid Stadium is partially named after him. So let's meet my guest, Bill Furstenberger to learn more about this Indiana writer. Welcome. Welcome. You're back. Thank, You're I'm back. back. Thank you for having me back. Gail, did I, did I come appropriately you dressed did. in Purdue garb today? And you even have a little R for Ross. Ross Aid. <laughs> Ross Aid. Exactly. Yes, that's what that's for. Well, this, this is, we're continuing in this line of American writers. Indiana writers. Indiana yes. authors. Yes. yes. Indiana is known as the author state for so many years and so many generations. And so we thought it'd be a, a great idea on dinner and a book to sort of trace them we over have. the years. And we're we, we've done quite a few, but we have a few more to go. I hope so. We're going to be looking for additional <laughs> writers. Well, we want to talk about George Aid and his history of writing fables. And we want to talk also about the food we're going to make today. And uh, I am, I'm going to just start by saying I'm making very simple Who's your food? We're going to have a creamed mm -hmm. corn pudding, and a pudding meaning, you know, a creamed corn, uh, and I'm, I'm adding uh, Jif, and I'm adding uh, butter, and uh, we're going to have a nice, it's a tasty dish for all kinds of festivities. And then I'm going to do a bourbon glazed ham, and you are going to do what? I am making stuffed mangoes, but it should be mentioned that we took the menu for today out of the sure. book. It was in one of the fables. They, they crammed all of these uh, foods into just one story. There isn't a whole lot of food in the book, but luckily we had this banquet in the one story, and so we had a lot of choices. And so it's interesting to note that 100 plus years ago, when somebody referred to a stuffed mango, they were probably referring to a stuffed green pepper like yes. we call it today. I was wondering about the time Abs and mangoes in the early 1900s. That's right. And there are still areas in West Virginia and Pennsylvania today and other areas of the country that still call stuffed peppers stuffed mangoes. But you know me and my desire to always, you know, challenge myself with messy types of foods here on Dinner in a Book. And I don't know of too many messier foods than You're brave. You're a mango. Brave. So we're going to try this out and see how it goes, folks. Will you just take a minute here to let me get this corn pudding you go right put ahead. together? We you are go right going ahead. to put I'll some be... cream corn and a can of drained regular corn, a stick of butter, and uh, sour cream, a cup of sour cream. And that adds a real creaminess and makes it sort of like a pudding. This goes into the oven after you have it stirred up for about 40 minutes or until it's bubbling and not no longer wobbly in the center. So we'll keep our eye on that. Okay, back to your mangoes. Back to my stuffed mango. What I've done is I've cut uh, a, a line all the way around, I guess you'd call it the long ways of the mango because if you've ever opened a mango before, there's a very large seed inside and it's yeah. kind of flat and long and narrow and we, we're trying to create two halves. And, and it's daunting, isn't it? And that here we seed. go. So now I've created the line and I'm going to try to carve out around this seed without seeing what I'm doing. <laughs> well, you <laughs> know we'll it's in the center. Up. That's all you know. I know it's in know. there. It's in there, right? I think it's hard we're gonna, to get those we're gonna seeds get out. It. We're going to get it. Once you get the first half out, the second half should be a little easier. It should be. That's the in word. Theory. It should in be. In theory. Yes. And I'm also trying to do this without puncturing the uh, the outer skin. Here we go, Gail. I think that our big moment. Ta -da. Ta -da. Hey, very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you did you. it with so, patience and precision. So I'm going to turn my 
water down a little bit. We're going to be using the, the stuffed mangoes. What we're going to stuff the mangoes with is just some five minute rice. Uh, but first, I need to carve out much of this mango flesh, the fruit, While you're and we're going to use that. While you're carving, I'm going to slip this corn pudding into the oven and keep my eye on the time. There. And actually, I'm going to get the rest of that seed out from the other side first. And then yes. I'm going to come back and get some of the, uh, how many, the mango flesh. How many uh, mangoes did you operate on before you came <laughs> to practice I, getting I, the seed? That, that is a trade secret. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to divulge how many, like how many I had to butcher <laughs> before. You like to live dangerously. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we were talking about the uh, Indiana writers, mm -hmm. and some have endured through time as excellent writers like Theodore Dreiser, mm -hmm. Booth Tarkington. Kurt Vonnegut has had another wave of celebrity. But tell us about George. I mean, George had a, he carved kind out a, a unique... Yeah. Yeah. We don't think of him as much as we think of some of the other uh, classic. By the way, so there we go. We got the seed out. And I am going to take Bravo. that and put it right into my water and get the heat turned up again to let it cook a little yeah. bit and, and take some of the juices and So you're going to use the juice? Or you are. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Good. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. looks wonderful. I had, I had never seen that done. And I thought of that myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to go down in history. Oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but back to George Aid. So, so uh, he is an American humorist, kind of in the Mark Twain uh, tradition. Yes. Uh, uh, Will Rogers, maybe, also in that same group. But they don't take themselves too seriously, you know? Well, the way he writes, he just flips off these very funny fables, and, and mm -hmm. it's used in a sort of a country vernacular. Mm -hmm. uh, its slang is the vernacular. These country folks moved into the cities at the time, you know, the beginning of the 1900s, and they, they brought this language along with them and he right. uses this this slang he calls it and it is funny there are some expressions that he uses over and over like good and plenty I did that job good and plenty and we've got fables on all kinds of characters and instances I'm going to slip my ham in here and let it warm a little bit well he was known as Indiana Aesop remember yes. that was kind of his nickname uh, we've all heard of Aesop's fables, and of course what makes uh, a fable a fable is that it's a concise, short story, but then it has a moral at the end. And without a moral, I don't know if you could consider it a fable. Probably not a fable. And some of these, these morals are just hilarious. I mean, and he does put people down. He, in a way, he laughs at people, but he's laughing at himself too, because he was born in a small town in Indiana, and he died in a small town in Indiana, and he only left to work as a, as a writer in Chicago for some time, but then he came back and stayed in Indiana. Very well educated at Purdue, and he was, you know, Sigma Chi, and he, yep. he helped raise money for the university. He was really very well known. A huge supporter yes. of Purdue University and his entire life and the fraternity. Uh, Sigma Chi, and, and really, you know, he became, for his time, um, an incredibly wealthy author. Uh, oh, you know, yes. We, we think of starving writers, starving artists sometimes. Not George Ade. He was nationally syndicated in, you know, 1900 and um, made a great living for himself, bought lots of land, mm -hmm. and yes, with his... Uh, friend David Ross, they purchased land on the uh, side of uh, the existing Purdue University, mm -hmm. donated it to the university, and then donated more money to build Ross yeah. Aid Stadium. So, Well, uh, I, make, I just want to mention that I'm making my glaze here, and at some point I will pull the ham out and brush it again on, uh, on the ham and let it bake. Um, I 
you can use cloves. I've just added some mustard, brown sugar, and a little bit of whiskey to give it a little kick, and it will So I just bake. wanted to show, too, that um, with the uh, mango pit in there, with the, the flesh, now you can see the water has taken on a, some of the juice and some of that flavor, and I've taken it off the heat, and so now I'm just going to make a regular five-minute so rice. And you're so you're going to do a... What kind of rice? It's it's jasmine minute rice. Oh, jasmine. I love it. You know, we have just about a minute here until we're going to go to our next sure. segment. But I, I, I want to mention one of these fables. It's called the fable of the good fairy with the lorgnette and why she got it good. And this is a, <laughs> a lady who decides she has no children. She gets bored taking care of her husband. So she thinks I will I will become benevolent. So she, when she switches her current out of the enthusiasm, the whole neighborhood has to put on blinders. She takes on this idea of being benevolent. Uh, it's amazing. And she, is, she lets the little children look at her rings, and she, her clothes are full of pinholes where she's been hanging medals on herself. And she used to go to a handball court every day and throw up bouquets letting them bounce back down and hit her. I mean, she had everything <laughs> planned to give her great recognition. So it's a story, you know, making fun of a certain type, a certain group, uh, and we'll get back to that in just a minute. But right now we're gonna take a little break. We wanna show you the menu today. We'll be right back. back and we're talking about George Aid's fables and slang and you're putting some finishing touches on your stuffed mangoes mango stuffed and mangoes. I'm going to glaze the ham and I'm going to put it back in the oven well, and you, you were nice enough to give me a couple of slices off your oh, ham so which nice. is wonderful yes. and so I'm just putting the chopped pieces of the ham and the mango in with the rice we're gonna Add a little dash of some seasoned salt. Use your favorite one that you like. And to add a little sweetness, I'm going to just a little swirl of maple syrup. And I'm putting my ham back in the oven, checking on the corn pudding. And there we go. Um, I think, you know, in some ways, I would think that would be a great salad. You wouldn't have to stuff a mango. No, you wouldn't have to, but you already have it. So. Yes, I know. And then you don't want to mix it up too much, or you might kind of make, you know, mush, it up. mush the mangoes yeah. all up. So I'm ready to just scoop them you do it. right out. And so, George Aid. <laughs> and you know, I, I was just laughing at some of these, these words he uses. You've just got to get, uh, well, there's a preacher that, that looks out on his congregation and they're falling asleep and he says, I have to do something to get them excited. And he, he's got to fix up his sermons good and plenty. That's another yeah, George aid. So he finds some really uh, distant writers, philosophers, and he throws them into his sermon and the people are wide-eyed and they think, oh, we're getting more paid for here. This is, and another one, you know, third act is another philosopher mm -hmm. and he's looking at his congregation and they're, they're so excited, they don't understand a word he's saying. And, uh, but the parishioners are so happy. The only thing is they worry now that maybe he'll be drawn away to another church. Uh, so the moral of this is give the people what they think they want. They don't understand the sermons <laughs> at all, but they're so intellectual. The people think, oh, I have a new look, outlook on life. The morals are like the punchlines, you know, yes. it's, it really is. And, and these stories are all, you know, four or five, at most six pages long. And you can read them in about three or four minutes. And, and that's what was so, so appealing, I think, yes. to people. And yeah. he became so famous. He became so successful. Um, anyway, I, in getting back to our do-gooder, our benefactor, uh, 
she says, now I'm going to carry s sunshine to the lonely places and the lowly places. So, you know, she's wandering around in the tenements and uh, she just, she goes to the house and she says, does your father drink? And uh, she says, well, tell your dad he should drink a claret for dinner and nothing more. Of course, these people don't even know what a claret is Speaking or a claret. Speaking of the lowly places and... and you know, oh. wetting our whistle. So oh, we're we're going to wet our whistle. We're going to do something in true Purdue tradition. Oh my gosh! And we're going to fix ourselves. I love tradition. Boilermakers. What else, right? Gosh, Has to I, be. I thought I never knew this was a drink. <laughs> I really didn't. Well, See, I learned something. You know that doesn't surprise me, Gail. You are a lady of refined taste. Oh, yeah. It's just like and, this benevolent lady. And so let's see, what did you say? You wanted uh, Canadian Sure, let's club celebrate whiskey. our neighbors to the north. So, absolutely. But go, only a half a shot, please. Okay, that's fine. Please. So this, there are two ways, two acceptable ways to have a Boilermaker. Oh, gosh. Um, I'm going to try something different, just to be different. Um, while, I, while you're doing that, do the you, bourbon, I think, I, to go you, with your bourbon ham. Would you serve this as a main dish, a side dish? I think it's a side dish, but you know, some people, if it, it has protein, it has carbs, it it's has. It's nice. A, yeah. You could put yeah, a little yeah, bit yeah. of cilantro on top. Yeah, okay. And so I'm going to have, oh I'm going to have the other version of a boiler maker that's, that uh, is where you just drop the glass uh right in your beer okay and so I would we will do this we will do this first but the purdue tradition boiler up hammer down <laughs> is that it there you go you may start oh and here gosh. we go this is worthy of a fable <laughs> <laughs> that's as far as i can go. <laughs> Here. Oh, I feel quite healthy though. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, boiler bakers, I wouldn't say, are known for their taste. <laughs> it's oh, now more you're about telling me. the effects of, you know, the celebration. You know, it, it really were. changes the taste of beer. Oh, it does. Yes. <laughs> That's right, mixing it this way. Gosh. Yeah. Well, to old Purdue, yes. Boiler up. Hammer down. <laughs> okay. Mm. Now, back to George A. Oh, yes. Now, back to the literary aspect. Well, I found his descriptions charming. Uh, if he's making fun at poor people, he's also making fun at rich people, oh, like absolutely. this benevolent lady. Or himself, too. And, yeah, and, yeah. And we've met benevolent ladies and benevolent gentlemen. Mm -hmm. And um, did you have a favorite well, well, one you know, in here? The one that I, the one that I used um, was. By the way, I should grab uh, grab my yes. historic early edition copy of Fables and Slang. Recall this is my shtick on dinner in a book is that I like to read copies. You of like early. to wear white gloves. I like to. Yes, I. <laughs> you can see me at my chair in my home reading in a white with white gloves. Um, the title of of mine is the fable of the unintentional heroes of Centerville and it's these two young guys who went off to the Spanish-American War um, and they were uh, didn't really do much when they were there but they came back from the war mm -hmm. come off the train a band starts playing the DAR uh, Ladies Society welcomes them with you know grand ovation they whisk them off to this huge banquet dinner and all this and when it's all over with they ask themselves you know did, are we heroes did, did we really do anything and the moral of the story is if it is your play to be a hero, don't renege. <laughs> do it well. <laughs> do it, do it, and do it well. But the other thing that was really amazing about about uh, when you look at an old book, and sometimes you get a surprise. And I got a surprise when I bought this book, Gail, because oh, it had yeah. what's referred to as an illumination. And I'm not sure how well the camera can get well, that. They'll, they'll catch there. that. They're brilliant so, at this. So that page started as black and white, but the owner, you can see they, they added their name and their little signature there. They kind of used it like a coloring book 
Was this typical? Did people do? I think people did do that. You needed things to do to just <laughs> enjoy yourself. You know? It's illumination. And yes. there are wonderful illustrations throughout this book. That's the only one that they actually illuminated. Mm -hmm. But that was a great bonus when I bought this book. You never You've know what you're going to find. You really do not. Just give me a moment here. I want to talk again. She goes to visit this, uh, these ignorant people, as she says, down in the. Uh, uh, tenement area and the mother said well he's afraid of you kindly explain to him that I take an interest in him even though he is the offspring of an obscure and w ignorant working man well I am probably the grandest thing that ever swept up the boulevard next time I come I hope to hear that your husband has stopped drinking and is very happy tell the small person under the bed that if he learns to spell ibex by the time I call again I will let him look at my ring how's that how's that george you know he makes fun of everybody and the the language is clever isn't it oh my yeah yeah and he had this uh idiosyncratic uh uh habit of capitalizing words in sent in the middle of the sentence just because he sort of wanted to highlight that yes, word yes. and that was a big thing with him uh, and so all through fables and slang you'll see that and it really does I mean if you kind of just go with it and you think why is that word capitalized then you'll be you know you'll be distracted yes, but if you you'll just miss the humor if you it. just go with it mm -hmm. it's really very entertaining to read well you know he also fed on this idea it was particularly a Midwestern thing, but I'm going to ask you if it happened all over America. People in certain areas were a bit leery of poets, reformers, mm. saints. They didn't care for eccentricity, snobbishness, and affectation. So he is puncturing a lot of balloons, and he's mm -hmm. setting all these people up. Yeah. And not only the swells, but the you know, ne'er do wells. Oh yeah, but it, it, it is hilarious. Yeah, and and think of the time too. He was born in 1866, died yeah. in 1944. So right at the end of the Civil War, after the Civil War is over, he's born, young child. But he dies during World War II. So that's the, the cusp of his influence in America is right when we're going from a rural. Uh, yes. agrarian society to an urban society yes. and he is able to walk in both of those worlds and speak about the common people yes. and for the common people and yes he does make fun of everybody else. everybody and I'm getting <laughs> a sign that we should be thinking about the next segment okay. so well. we're going to uh, show you some pictures of George Aid, a very handsome man and uh, we'll come right back we're inviting you to dinner come to our modest but <laughs> elegant Hoosier meal, Very right? Good. Okay. Can't wait. <laughs> we'll be right back. Well, I enjoyed George Aid's fables in slang. Thank you for suggesting it. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. I mean, it was a, a great book. It, it was a book, of course, in its times. Yes. And you have to accept it that way. But, I mean, uh, what a great humorist and what a great, great sense of humor he had. He really did. He really did. And uh, we just want to go over what we prepared, a kind of a... Hoosier meal, Indiana mm -hmm. meal. Mm -hmm. So tell us about well, your. Well, my stuffed mangoes there with uh, the, the, the mango rinds and then uh, jasmine rice with a little bit of your ham. Thank you for yes. that. And so that's a nice side dish. What did you prepare? Well, I, I just wanted to tell you, I'm impressed with this, and I may steal it and put it in my repertoire. Oh, I hope so. I think so. <laughs> High praise. Yeah. Well, I made the corn pudding that is so easy to put together. In fact, I was reading the recipe, and it sounds like it was written by George Aid. It's he's, this person says, this stupid easy cream corn casserole recipe is made with a store-bought Jiffy cornbread mix. And that's not an apology. I mean, <laughs> here I am reading this and I say, it must be George writing Sounds this. Sounds like you wrote it. Yes. Well, and then we have our ham. I have a glazed ham with mustard, brown sugar, and bourbon. Mm -hmm. And a little side here of Norwegian lingonberry to serve. Sure. And of course, we've got this magnificent drink. We have our boiler makers. <laughs> Should we have one more boiler up? 
hammer down <laughs> or is it a handle? No, you got it I got it right. a hammer down, <laughs> got it. Mm. Yes, so I did enjoy, I did enjoy the book. Thanks for suggesting George Aid. You're and, very welcome. And you know, we enjoyed having you. Remember, good food, good friends, good books really make for an excellent life. We'll see you next time. Cheers to old Purdue. <laughs>this WNIT local production has been made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Dinner and a Book is supported by the Rex and Alice A. Martin Foundation of Elkhart, celebrating the spirit of Alice Martin and her love of good food and good friends.